So I'm back at CS 2019 in the AMD booth with James Pryor. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, and congratulations on not crashing during your demo. <laughs> it's very impressive. Thank you, thank you. So I have a few questions about um, Zen 2 and uh, 2019 for AMD. Let's do it. So starting with some of the more technical ones, um, but a general technical question. Uh, so what are the main things that are new with Zen 2? Well, we haven't gone into a lot of detail about Zen 2 yet, but we have talked a little bit about, you know, the new architecture is based on, you know, using our 7 nanometer process technology. It's going to give us an incredible performance and efficiency increase. We're, you know, we're goofing up the front end, done some great work on the core throughput. So you're going to get a nice, healthy bump in performance. Uh, you saw our demo. We are going head to head, eight cores, 16 thread versus our competitors, eight cores, 16 thread. Same performance, but 30%, 50 watts lower power. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really good place to be just this early on, right? This is very new, very early, no final clocks yet. So a lot of, a lot of potential to come there. Mm -hmm. So one of the main things that you guys talked about throughout the entire keynote was seven nanometer. Seven nanometer was kind of the big thing. I mean, I assume that's why it's called the Radeon 7. <laughs> Um, so what are the primary benefits of the 7 nanometer process, specifically the process from, I believe it's TSMC, yeah, that AMD is using? Yeah, it's from TSMC. Um, for 7 nanometer, the benefits are you get that really fast transistor, it's low power, it's got a great characteristics that are suited really, really well for high performance computing. So the reason why we talk a lot about 7 nanometer is because we are one of the leading companies in the world on the bleeding edge. We are out in front on this kind of uh, technology, right? So these are the world's first server, graphics, and desktop processes based on 7 nanometer technology, and we're bringing them all to market in the same year at the same time, roughly speaking. So you're gonna get this massive improvement in performance from our brand new architectures at the same time as you're getting increased efficiency, which is lower power. Like, so for, and the reason why that's important is you think about the desktop market. With our new seven nanometer third gen Ryzen processors, we're not gonna need new coolers, no new TDPs, no new motherboards. Everything's just gonna work as a drop-in upgrade. And that's gonna be fantastic for everybody out there that's already got a PC that's kinda, you know, ready to just update simply and easily. We're not gonna see some of the uh, niggles you saw from other launches where, you know, here was our previous high-end platform from a, a different manufacturer and then they have a new board six months later that's got new increased power requirements. That story and those problems aren't our story. Our story is it's just going to work. You know, get the BIOS, update the motherboard, drop in the processor, and go. That's wonderful. So something that I noticed, especially during the Next Horizons event, that was a few months ago, yeah. uh, when we got our first taste of Zen 2, the I.O. die, was, or the, all the I.O. controllers were on a separate die. What are the main advantages or reasons for doing that? Uh, it really allows us to increase our efficiency and it, you know, we can target the t process technology to the transistors that benefit from it. So cores, CPU cores, they, they, you get a lot of benefit by moving to seven nanometer. The circuitry and logic for IO, like PCIe, Gen 4, memory controllers or fabric controllers or whatever else, doesn't benefit as much from that shrink from those new transistors. So what it lets us do is target the improvements where it makes the most benefit and then continue to use a great, high performance, fast, accessible transistor in another area to keep it and give us more flexibility. So this modularity, flexibility, performance where it's needed gives us a more adaptable, high performance product. So now, while we're on the topic of the dies and the CPU package, I'm gonna address what I think everyone's thinking. There's a little gap there. A lot of people are speculating maybe that there's room for a little more on that package. Um, what comments does AMD uh, have to make about that? Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting observation. I'll, I'll let our product team know. Oh, interesting. So you're not going to give us anything more right now? Uh, about, about what? I, uh, <laughs> I see how it is. So, okay. So uh, back to IO memory. So back when Ryzen first launched, uh, memory was a bit of a rough patch for it uh, in terms of compa compatibility and uh, stability at high speeds. So how, without giving away too much, obviously, uh, how does Zen 2 seem to improve this? Is it just um, the having the separate controller on a separate die or is there more to it? 
Um, you know, a little early to go into full details there, but you know, you saw from first gen Ryzen to second gen Ryzen a strong focus on compatibility and supporting third party overclocking um, through uh, different mechanisms. We're going to continue to do that. So you can still what we could do in one year. You know, now that we're two years on, we'll come up on the third year of Ryzen, the third generation. You can expect to see improvements. You know, in the compatibility, the speeds that we support. It's it's just going to keep getting better. Okay, wonderful. Now. It was also mentioned that Zen 2 supports PCI Express 4.0. Again, another first. So what are some of the primary advantages that AMD seeks to get from going with PCI Express 4? Uh, so you know, we do have the, the world's first uh, Gen 4 graphics card in the data center. Right, so we've got our uh, ready on instinct. They already support Gen 4, and that's okay, no that's where <laughs> yeah, that's okay. You can keep it up. But, uh, that's where you know because you're pushing so much data back and forth from the CPU to the GPU that the extra bandwidth is really needed. For the desktop consumer platform, being first to Gen 4 is very very good. It's not a requirement for 2019, but it's going to help people, especially people buying uh, pre-built PCs who are thinking, I want this thing to last three, four, five years. You know, they get that more future-proof message. They get that more future-proof capabilities. Now they've got the latest speeds. They're not kind of buying the last of the old gen. They're buying the first of the new gen. And that's very appealing to a lot of people, right? They want to, to know, hey, my platform is going to be around for a while. I'm going to have upgrades. I'm going to have scalability. It's going to be a good PC. All right. Now, you also mentioned drop-in compatibility with older motherboards, yeah. like the 300 and 400 series, as well as, I'm assuming, the new 500s that will launch with Ryzen later this year. Um, how will that affect PCI Express 4 compatibility on older motherboards? Well, it's going to be down to the motherboard maker to go off and see if they can validate um, for Gen 4. So uh, electrically, Gen 3 and Gen 4 are like 90% identical, or even more than that, right? So if it's just a simple link from like the, the CPU to the endpoint, you know, to the graphics expansion slot, then it's probably likely that that'll be able to upgrade to Gen 4, and they just got to do the validation work. But if there's muxes or if there's switches inside of that path, then they're probably not going to be rated for the speeds uh, of from the new Gen 4 standard, so they're probably not going to be able to bifurcate or support that new speed. Now, because we've got all the motherboard guys going out there making new motherboards that are coming out with our new product, then I don't know if they're going to go off and validate their old products before they get to their new products. They're probably just going to say, you know what, just buy, if you want Gen 4, buy my new product. If you're happy with Gen 3 and you just want to drop in upgrade, you continue to use what you've got or buy a new one from my existing product line. Kind of balance everything out. It's, it's, it seems like, you know, oh, you should drive it and make everything Gen 4, but that's a lot of work. It's a lot of validation. And until we have wide mainstream adoption of PCIe Gen 4 in graphics cards, storage, expansion cards, it doesn't make sense to make everybody go and validate and spend all that time and money and effort on turning on something that 90% of people aren't going to use right away. So, you know, Gen 4 is incredibly attractive to enthusiasts, to DIYers, to people looking future looking, but that's not everybody who's bought a PC. So there's going to be a ton of interest in those um, capabilities, but I think you want, if you, if you are interested in those, you want a board designed for it. And that's why I think most of the, most of the boards that people want are going to be the new ones. All right. So as for Zen 2-based Threadripper, I know nothing's official yet, but is it safe to assume that it will again be based on a similar design as the Epic server chips, or could we expect something uh, a little different? Way too early to talk about the, the next generation of Threadripper. Um, you're going to see you're going to see some nice things happening there, and, and never safe to assume anything. So. We, we, might, we might have some surprises in there for you. We might not. It's, we'll just have to wait and see. All right. Again, back to those uh, extra package dies. Um, a lot of people have been saying that, or I've heard online that those will not be used for APUs. So in terms of desktop-based APUs based on Zen 2, we won't be seeing uh, quite the same design. It'll be a different approach, uh, especially because you'll be thinking mobile first. Um, why is that, or like, what do you have to say for that? So our strategy currently is we do a new architecture and our process technology, and then we optimize it. And if you look at that, that's kind of a, a, a one, you know, one year or one and a half year cadence on those things. So think about desktop Ryzen. You saw a desktop chip um, that had pure CPU cores, first generation Ryzen. And then you know, a little while later, you saw a version that had integrated Radeon Vega graphics inside of it. Right, so now you've kind of got the cadence and the timing. So what you've seen 
This year at CES, we announced our Ryzen 3000 mobile processors. So these are the updates to our first Zen plus Vega APUs. Now we're going to take those further on. You know, it's a little too early to say what we're going to do in the desktop, but we're not going to change strategies. So you'll see um, all the design updates and everything else from Zen 2 in a future design, which you won't see it like interrupting our cadence. All right, so we're going to keep on the same cadence, nice and predictable, easy to use, because we've got a great story with today with our um, Ryzen 2000 APUs, right? We've got leadership in graphics. We, you know, we can deliver an incredible esports story right there. You know, and our competitor is, is you know, not able to compete on graphics at that price point. We, you know, it's, it's, it's all us. So we're going to continue to drive fast and hard there. Great CPU, we have great improvements there, and great GPU. And we'll improve that as well. Right. So you mentioned the new Ryzen Mobile 3000, which I actually have right here. Yeah. Uh, can you mention just some of the few highlights, some of the key new features that these will bring to the table? Well, you get an incredible new battery life. We've got much, much uh, better battery life. So that's through from improved idle power as well. So that's due to moving to the 12 nanometer process technology, m adopting the Zen Plus cores. We've got uh, some great new features enabled now, like uh, wake on voice command, as well as you know, support for free, uh, FreeSync 2, which gives you 4K HDR. As, as sort of a content playback. So everything, everything all or overall is improved in the Ryzen mobile product line, including we've got a brand new support model where every driver we release for our mainstream graphics is going to support Ryzen mobile processors as well. And that'll apply to desktop APUs at the same time. So one driver to rule them all on a regular cadence. Uh, throughout the year, you'll get those updates and everything will be all at the same time. Right, yeah, that was a big concern that even I had uh, about a year ago with my Ryzen mobile laptop that I have, where I, I had driver issues. A lot of people have been talking about that. So just to confirm, existing Ryzen 2000 mobile will also receive these same monthly updates straight from AMD, yes? Uh, it's not monthly. It's on a, a slightly different cadence, but every major update that we release for graphics is going to include all of those products. Okay, that's wonderful to hear. So also, another thing that was a little bit of an issue for some people, the availability of certain laptops. There wasn't much to really choose from in terms of mo Ryzen mobile laptops. It seems like you have a slightly better selection this year. Is AMD planning on reaching out to more manufacturers or trying to get um, even more laptops this time around? Absolutely. You know, we, we, uh so you know, whenever you do a brand new design for the first time, the production ramp up and the availability worldwide takes a little bit longer than what you've typically seen. What we're able to do is because this is our next generation of Ryzen Mobile, it's a much faster cycle to get those designs updated and adopted. So now we're seeing much, much faster ramp. But we hit all the major global OEMs. They've got commercial and consumer designs. So you've got business class as well as um, consumer class notebooks. It all become in the market much, much faster because it's, it's existing, it's known. People will now also know to look for Ryzen mobile laptops. So the demand gen is there, the features and performance are there, the script adoption is there. It's going to be an incredible story. Okay. So back at CES 2017, so two years ago, back when you were first announcing Ryzen, uh, you launched your first set of chipsets, X370, B350, et cetera. But you also announced two... Um, chipset specifically for fo small form factors, A300 and B300. But adoption for those has been extremely limited. I think the first one that I've heard of was announced this CES. So a lot of the uh, ITX boards in the past have adopted the full-size chipsets. Do you have any idea of why that is? Um, it's primarily because of the market. Um, people buying mini ITX right now want premium mini ITX. They want as full features as they can get. So even though that means that maybe not all the features of the chips that are used in the motherboard, um, because of space reasons, routing, layout, and all that kind of stuff, it's still a premium buyer, and they want premium features. And they want a premium brand, too. So they're all lined up to use the high end. So as we you know, go into new markets, you know, the first year of Ryzen was about covering the basics and getting <coughs> like uh, premium desktops, and <coughs> excuse me, premium desktops, enthusiasts, getting them on board. Now that we're moving through into the next level of success and the, the regular everyday Joe is walking into Best Buy or whatever and saying, hey, 
I need a, a great desktop and I want it to be powered by Ryzen, now comes the drive to get more and more options available to hit the different price points that people want to have. So, you know, even though we announced them all and saw what you might consider a slow adoption, it was a build it and they will come moment, right? We gave them the options, the flexibility. They looked at it and said, this is what we're going to do. And we enjoyed incredible success. In 2018, according to Mercury Research, we gained 41% market share year on year. That's a massive increase, right? So, you know, 2019, I think we're going to see everyone stop talking about Ryzen as a great alternative to Ryzen being the right choice. Right, and that's that's our goal for 2019, and that's why we've got this incredible portfolio of products. Ryzen Mobile, the seven nanometer CPUs and GPUs, are all going to drive AMD to be not the alternative but the default choice. Okay, that's wonderful to hear. So, that's enough for the uh, more technical questions. So, I just have a few more about just generally AMD in 2019. So, what are your expectations for AMD in 2019? Oh wow. Uh, well, I think. I'd refer back to what I just said, right? We're going to become the, the default choice. We're going to do a lot of hard work around our partners, making sure that we're enabling everybody to do the right things with our products. So I'm expecting us to have you know, a, a really strong year with some great uh, new products coming to market, which are going to enable a whole bunch of great new uh, PCs for people to build and buy. All right. So what's one key area that you'd like to focus on this year and going forward? Um, in terms of what, like a business or technology or what? Uh, technology, I think. Technology, technology. I think I'm, you know what, I'm a CPU enthusiast. I'm a performance junkie. I'm uh, it's performance, right? I want to mm -hmm. see that that per core performance. I want to see the, the efficiency. I want to see the what do you, what can we push the limits on in terms of turning you know those electrical watts from the outlet wall into real work. Where we you know better gaming, better creating, cr better streaming, all of those things. That's that's what I want to see really this year is just how much more we can do. All right. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It's been wonderful. And I hope our viewers enjoy. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and my coverage of CES so far. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of the updates. And follow me on Twitter at Solid State Tweet to get first updates on absolutely everything. If you have something you'd like to say, any comments, thoughts, leave a comment down below. Don't forget to leave a like if you like the video. And I'll see you guys very soon.